Now, let's look at what we can do to prepare as governments and as individuals. What about testing? Let's go straight to another question, because Richard from South London asks, I have coronavirus-like symptoms and went to a London hospital to be tested, but I was turned away as I hadn't been in contact with an infected person or been to an infected area. What should I do now? Jake. Well, we have clear criteria for testing. Not everybody needs testing. Um, where testing is indicated, we're doing everything we can to make that easily available uh, through different options, such as uh, testing in a hospital, sometimes testing in community centres, uh, special uh, areas of the community, and occasionally testing at home and doing drive-through testing as well. So it's really about whether you need testing um, and then making testing available. You mentioned drive-through testing. These the pictures of that actually happening in Seattle. When you look at testing, it is fascinating, the figures. South Korea has tested about 3,500 people per million. The US, the figure is five per million. Just how critical is testing? Testing is very important, and the amount of testing does vary between countries. In the UK, we are increasing our testing capacity. But again, it's important about um, who is tested, and that may change over time. All right, uh, Jake, stay with me because I've uh, got more questions for you. But uh, I want to uh, show you this piece because should the West look to the East as a model of how best to prepare? Well, from Singapore, the BBC's Mariko Oi has been monitoring the Asian response. When the coronavirus outbreak started in China last December, its Asian neighbours were the first to react. Let's take a look at various measures taken by the governments in the region. In China, it's a lockdown. It took Beijing a few weeks to react, and when they did, the authorities took a harsh approach, which affected nearly 60 million people. The coronavirus outbreak brought back memories of SARS in Hong Kong. Officials there were quick to respond by shutting down schools. Critics, though, wanted the government to do more and prevent the arrival of Chinese visitors. And that's exactly what the government here in Singapore did. It was one of the first countries to shut its borders to China. It's also put in place a highly sophisticated contact tracing procedure to track down people who'd been around patients who tested positive. That sounds manageable with a population of just over five and a half million. Compared to South Korea, whose population is over 50 million. Seoul is mass testing anyone with flu-like symptoms, but critics say its approach has overwhelmed its hospitals. So there you have it, lockdown, school closures, contact tracing, and aggressive testing. If you put them all together, maybe that's the perfect approach to containing coronavirus. But how difficult would it be to carry it out in the rest of the world? Jake, uh, answer that question straight away. That model from China and that region, how easy or not to replicate in the West? Every country will have different solutions, uh, but the principles are going to be the same, which is really about spreading, uh, limiting the spread of infection, slowing down the spread of infection, and it's going to involve a package of measures. Um, so those that have been mentioned are important, but they may be implemented at different times by different countries according uh, to what the risks are in those countries at that time, and also um, whether it's proportionate to the risk. Straight to another question, this time from Sandy via Twitter, who asks, can you actually catch this twice? We are still uh, collecting evidence. This is a new disease, but we do not think that once you've had coronavirus infection uh, that you are at an immediate risk of getting infected again. So we think that the infection will give you some immunity. What's unclear is how long that immunity will last for. All of the countries in their response looking at particular vulnerable groups. Uh, in terms of the elderly, one particular group, and uh, we know the statistics are much higher in that particular uh, group and that dynamic, uh, what is the best advice? Say, uh, if we want to help a neighbour, uh, go round, take food. Uh, is that help or is that potentially exposing them to be infected? 
So we do need to look out for uh, uh, older members of society. We know they are at increased risk, um, but you need to do that properly and carefully. So if you have symptoms of a respiratory illness, um, then you shouldn't be going and, and visiting elderly people. You should be trying to avoid that um, as a neighbor, for example. Um, but there are other ways that we can uh, help our older members of society without putting them at risk. So. Um, uh, making sure that they have food delivered, for example, uh, is a good way, and just keeping in touch with them if they are at home to make sure that they're feeling okay. So lots of different ways, but close contact, that is the thing to avoid. Absolutely. Well, uh, let's uh, look at uh, another aspect of uh, being prepared is having enough to actually live on at home and in the office. Uh, we've seen stockpiling in pockets around the world with hand sanitizers uh, top of people's list. Italy has seen a run on pasta, which appears to have confirmed the notion that penne without ridges is the least popular. In Switzerland, canned goods and baby food are flying off the shelves. Panic buying there has been named hamster coifen after the cheek stuffing rodent. And lots of examples of shoppers hoarding toilet paper with fights breaking out in supermarkets in Australia. One newspaper even printed, listen to this, extra blank pages for readers in case of emergencies. Well, Darshini is with me, and Darshini, just a few examples yes. from uh, around the world. We'll, we'll skip over that last bit, but uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, the necessity, because of course, government advice is that there's no need to do this. That is government advice, but uh, you mentioned it there, being prepared. It's human nature. If we think there are going to be shortages, if there are going to be problems for us to get to the shops and get what we need, you are going to stock up. And you can see there exactly what people are doing. It's the you know non-perishable foods, it's the toilet rolls. Um, there's also, of course, pictures of empty to, you know, shelves where soap should be as well. Uh, so part of that is human nature, but on the other hand, as you say, governments are talking to supermarkets, they're talking to manufacturers. I know of one manufacturer, for example, of disinfectants, producing more of those lines. This is 2020. They know what they're doing. They have a very clear eye on what patterns are, are, are going on. And frankly, you know, don't panic too much. Only buy what you need. When you look at those pictures of empty supermarket shelves, what were people doing before they bought all that soap? What were they washing with? Uh, and it is extraordinary because the advice is so clear. Just this morning, I drove past uh, a chemist mm -hmm. and I had to do a double take because I, there was a queue that went right round the corner and up the hill. I'd never seen anything like that before. No, absolutely. And you hear reports of people going in and the supply you know, there is a delivery of 10 bottles of hand sanitizer and they're buying eight of them. What are you going to do with those eight bottles? And that creates further panic as well. It is human nature. But as I say, supermarkets are incredibly sophisticated. They have forecasters out there. They know where their gaps are going to be. We have very agile manufacturers out there who can switch production. So don't panic too much.